All right, guys, so this is gonna be a quick rundown on how I was able to take a 3D scan using the LiDAR camera on the iPhone to import it into Blender and create a 3D environment that you can actually move a 3D camera around in. And I figured it was a really cool technique. You could use it for a lot of different things. You could make whole animations out of it, but mostly we're gonna use it for pre-vising. So you can actually kind of use the camera to scan an environment of a scene that you're gonna be shooting at and plan out your shots without having to spend a whole bunch of time setting up lights and the camera and everything like that. So let's dive into it. So a quick disclaimer, the app that I'm using is Scanniverse. I know that Cameron uses Polycam, which works pretty good too. I did pay $15 for the year's subscription, which gives you the 8K textures but I don't think that that's really necessary, mostly because the geometry kind of just looks like you melted your house. Uh, it's not really that precise. It's really good with scaling and measurements. The textures are really nice, but because the geometry is just so janky, I don't know if paying that extra couple bucks is really worth it. I do know that some apps make you pay in order to export the files. I did try it out with my iPad that does not have the LiDAR scanner, and these apps just don't work. So to keep that in mind, this is going to be mostly specific towards those people that have the newer iPhone or the newer iPad or an Android phone that do have the LiDAR camera. So first things first, in order to prep your scene, I really recommend closing blinds, closing some shutters. In general, it's really nice to have soft ambient light whenever you're doing any sort of 3D scan because it helps not bake in any hard shadows or hard lights. It's also really important to tidy up the area. Um, just in general, you want a nice clean uh, scan. It's not really good at picking up small objects, so hide any little things that you don't need out. So after that, uh, you can open up the app and kind of get right going. You can see here that when you tap the range button, it actually shows like a perimeter of the outside edges of the walls and it actually hits and interacts with objects. And what I notice is you wanna just kind of keep that range at the furthest amount. If you keep it too small, it doesn't really make sense because you kind of run into a situation where it will lose tracking and when you're doing the scanning, it's really important to do nice, long, easy sweeps. Um, it says to get as many angles as possible. So what I like to do is kind of back up to a wall, face the camera on the opposite direction, and just scan across the room. And then once you get to the other side, either lift the camera up and tilt it down, or move the camera down and tilt it up to get the floors in the corners. Uh, I always seem to miss a little bit of spots like in the middle of the room or in the middle of like the ceiling, uh, which can be important uh, because it's extra detail that you really need, especially if you're going to create like a moving camera throughout the, uh, the whole scene. You can see how sometimes it loses tracking too. Um, so if you get too close to a corner, it might kind of get stuck and lose its positioning. So that's why it's really important to kind of keep nice, slow, broad motions, you know, go around corners, go underneath objects. And it's really neat. So the way that it works, as you can see here, it actually builds 3D geometry first. And then when you go through on the other side, before it fills in that texture, you can actually see that texture backwards. Uh, so here I'm just going in, just filling in any, you know, spots I might've missed. Anywhere that there's red and white lines, you just want to get rid of. So go around the corners. Um, you want to avoid, like I said, those windows, the shiny objects. Uh, you can't really, you know, help it there. You can see how like the middle of the window didn't really get filled in. And then just kind of go around the room, just fill in any last little spots. Uh, like I said, the middle of the ceiling, middle of the floors. And when you're all set, you can just hit stop and it'll kind of go through and show you a rough estimate of what it looks like. This is a good time to kind of figure out if it looks accurate. Before you hit process, what you see here is actually a point cloud, it's essentially all the vertices intersections, just so you can get the general idea without adding all the textures, which takes up most of the file sizes. After I hit process, you can see the file size is about 85 megabytes. So that's like 10% of a gig. So it's a, it's a pretty decent size file. And then when you're all set, you can just uh, share it. 
There's a lot of different file formats that you can share. I particularly just use uh, OBJ. It seems to be the most universal file. And you can see here that this is what I was talking about where the textures uh, and the details are really high, but the geometry is just kind of wonky. It really just makes it look like my kitchen is like melted. So once I email it to myself, I can download it. I'm gonna take that whole folder and just drop it into another folder, the whole thing over there, cause you wanna keep the OBJ and then the texture files. So once you're in Blender, you're gonna to wanna to go into import and then select wavefront.obj. So that's the file type that you're gonna to wanna to look for. And then you can see right there, there's gonna be two files, the MTL and the OBJ. So you're just gonna open up the OBJ file and it does take a second to open up. I just cut that part out. So once you have your OBJ in, you can change the viewing modes. And this is kind of doing that thing that I was telling you about where you see all the textures reversed. So it's not the same view as when you were inside the app where you could see through the walls. So here's a quick little tip. So you're gonna wanna go to the materials properties, scroll down till you'll see settings, and then click backface culling. So essentially what that does is it just makes it so the backside of textures are invisible. So every time you rotate the camera past a wall, you can actually see through it. So it's a lot like, you know, when you play Sims or something like that. Then you're gonna wanna go to, into object mode and you're gonna wanna clean it up a little bit. So there's a bunch of little bits, just some unneeded geometry, just taking up some space. So you can see I'm kinda going through here and just selecting a bunch of points and deleting the vertices. So you can see that there's still some floating bits. When you're in object mode, click faces, select a face, use control L to select all the faces that are connected, control I to invert that selection, press X, then you can actually delete all those extra vertices that you don't need. Now switch back into object mode and add yourself a nice curve. Make sure it's a Bezier curve. And you're gonna wanna take some time really kind of finessing this, getting it to look right, because this is essentially what the camera is going to track. So you can see I kind of curved it out, move it into position so it's going through the door, and then I raise it up to be about where a camera would be in the scene. Go up to add, add a camera, drop that in. Then you wanna go and add an empty. And then you're gonna to wanna to parent these two together. So what you gotta do is in the menu, select the empty and then select the camera. And then you can't just press control P to parent in the folder. So in order to actually do this, you need to have the mouse just hovering over the project area, not in the menu. I don't know why it does that, but that's just how it works. Now, once they are parented, you can now take the camera and you can go to a constraint tab and add a follow path. Once you add that, you can select the target, which is going to be the Bezier curve, and you can see it snap to it. And this little slider here is what you're gonna use to actually move the camera along that Bezier. Now, one problem that you might notice is that the camera is facing the window. It's not straight forward. So one way around that is that we're gonna add another empty, add another constraint, follow path, and then select the target as the Bezier curve. And then select the camera and add a track to constraint. And then for that, the target is going to be that second empty. Now to actually make the camera look at this empty, you're gonna wanna offset it just a little bit along the line. So you wanna actually just put it a little bit ahead of where the camera is. And now you just have to make sure that when you edit the keyframes for the camera to go along the track, that you just keep the target just a little bit ahead of it. So you can see here, as you move it along the line, the camera just constantly stares at it, which is really nice. And now you have a really janky, sort of camera motion that's gonna, if it was a roller coaster, you would just be so nauseous. So uh, now you're gonna spend like 15 minutes and just adjust it till it looks, you know, semi nice. There we go. And then around here, I realized I, I just wanted it to, it just felt boring that it just went straight across. So I took the end of that Bezier curve and I raised it, added a little bit of a tilt. And then at this point, Cameron mentioned, what if the camera started down first and then worked its way up? And then I spent like 20 minutes trying to figure out why I couldn't get it to do that. And then I realized that I was adjusting the parameters of the camera. And what you actually wanna do is use this transform location from the empty that the camera is targeted to. And then, you know, for the next couple of minutes, you can just tweak that line because it's gonna drive you crazy, but eventually you're gonna get there. But anyway, as soon as you do, this is what you get. Uh, nice, it's a camera movement and it's not as jarring. Still feels like a weird roller coaster ride, 
but we're going to go with it. So now onto the fun part. Drop in a cube, scale it up so it's almost like your scene is inside a small box, just big enough to just fit around it. And then you want to go into the shading editor. Create a new material, delete the principled PSDF. Essentially replace it with a principled volume. Connect the volume to the volume and then adjust the density and the emission strength. Uh, just make the density as low as possible and then you can also bring the emission pretty dang low too. And now if you switch back into your rendered view and then go into the camera, you can see it looks like fog, but it is very dark, like really dark. Uh, so just adjust the admission strength until it kind of, you can see it looks like a spooky, uh, shadowy cave, almost like a depth map. Of course, you can play with it to your liking. Um, but now you can go in and add a light. Make sure it's a point light. You don't want to do like an area light or anything like that because you want it to have a 360 illumination because you want it to shine really bright on the light source and then bounce off of the walls and everything else from there. So I'm just going to go through and uh, adjust the light just a little bit more to my liking. And then I'm actually just gonna copy and paste this light. And the reason why I'm doing this is because later on, if I adjust any light that is from that copy and pasted section of lights, it will apply that same color and brightness and everything to every single one of those lights. And you can automatically see how much more dynamic this is because the, the lights are kind of bouncing off of everything. It's actually casting real shadows. So now I'm gonna go through and just kind of toss these lights in about every window and then everywhere that kind of makes sense. So I have like a window that leads to a mudroom. There's a couple rooms down that hallway. So I'm gonna add lights there. A little bit of a light coming from the stairway. And now you can see we have a beautiful scene. And uh, you can just leave it like this. Uh, that's that's perfectly fine. It's it's a really nice way to kind of get a start. Um, and now you can see here that I'm just kind of tweaking around with the colors uh, and you can really just kind of make it look however you want. Um, but eventually just keep tweaking with it and it will look pretty realistic. Now, if you're unhappy with how bright the room is, you can actually go through and add an area light um, to the ceiling just it just kind of adds a little bit of extra ambience without adding like a global illumination um, I think it just makes it feel a little bit more realistic even though this isn't accurate to how the lighting works we're also working in a computer you know simulation based program so it's not going to do exactly like what real life is is gonna do so yeah uh, that's pretty much it um, I hope you guys like this tutorial. There's uh, a lot that you can really do with this. And uh, I, I also should say that like I just started using Blender really, really recently, if I didn't say that in the beginning of the video. But yeah, it's been really fun. Uh, I, I, I just know that there's a lot that I'm going to be able to do with this in the future. And hopefully you can apply this uh, to a lot of different things. So yeah, I'm going to send you off with this little disco dance party. So if you think of anything else that might be really handy, make sure to leave it in the comments. Um, I know that there's a lot of different things, uh, a lot of different Blender tutorials out there. I know Ian Hubert has some incredible tutorials. I know uh, Peter France from Corridor Digital has some uh, really great tutorials. I actually just recently got into this mostly because he did a couple of uh, doing some photogrammetry using my actual camera to take a bunch of pictures and then adding them into this program. But they definitely know way more about that. So make sure to go check those guys out. And until then, I'll catch you guys later.